so hello everyone and, and thank you so much for making time to join us um this is uh, my name is frank aswani i'm the ceo of african venture philanthropy alliance uh we're a pan-african network of social investors looking to increase the flow of resources uh financial and non-financial into the social investment space in africa um this is this series of webinars is a collaboration between avp and, and suncup we are very excited to be having you over for the second uh, webinar. Uh, a lot of what we are discussing are, uh, this is related to how the continent is responding to the COVID-19 crisis, and especially um, connected to uh, issues affecting the most vulnerable. Uh, last week, we heard from a set of speakers who spoke about uh, various initiatives being done um, where some coalitions were getting together and formed to, to address this issue. This week, we're super excited to be looking at the issue of food. And this food issue um, was, was raised um, quite significantly in last week's uh, webinar. And so we're responding also to uh, the, the asks of uh, the, the, the audience. And, um, and just to building on also some of the stuff that AVP is doing already, we have communities of response that are currently running in Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. So, so, so this is this is great to also see. And welcome to people who are signing in from all over the world. We had uh, almost a very international representative uh, audience last week. So, um, I hope you enjoy this audience. And over back to Ariel. Thanks so much, Ray. Thank you. Um, so, Margaret, if you just want to go to the next uh, slide, um, I'll just briefly introduce. And Margaret, if you want to go into presentation mode, uh, I think that would be that would be good. Um, just to quickly introduce myself, I'm Ariel Molino. I lead the Sankop Forum in Africa. Um, we are a global convening network, um, and we have started these dialogue series um, at the request and, and encouragement of Nancy and Frank at AVPA to do this in coordination with them. Um, so we're delighted to have you all join us. Um, I'll just go through a few brief housekeeping items. So for those of you who are joining us, we will take all questions in the chat box. Um, so for those of you who don't see the chat box, there should be an option at the bottom of your screen, um, a little messaging bubble that says chat. As the speakers are speaking, please do go ahead um, and, and, and put your questions in the chat box and we'll field them after all of the um, presenters have, have completed their, their comments and remarks. Um, there are options for reactions. You'll see that at the bottom of your screen. And if you click on the manage participants button, um, you'll be able to, to see other options um, to sort of give feedback. Yes, no, you can clap your hands. You can tell us you need a coffee break or whatever. Um, so please feel free to use the chat. Um, it would be great as you guys are entering. It would be wonderful just to see who's here and where you're from. So just drop us your name and, and what city or country you're coming from. Um, we're delighted to have you all join us. Um, Margaret, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so we'll be hearing from four speakers today. Uh, we'll start with Samir Ibrahim from Shikilia. Then we'll hear from James Ouma from Life Song. We have David Aniele, who is joining us from Nigeria today uh, with the Center for Citizens with Disabilities. And we'll wrap up with Mac Matthew uh, from the World Food Program uh, to sort of round out our conversation. Um, you've already heard from Frank. <laughs> Uh, Nancy is, is on the call, and I think you'll hear from her probably in a little bit. Uh, Margaret, can we go ahead to the next slide? Um, and just to, to sort of recap here, we have uh, about 20 or 25 minutes for our opening remarks, and then we've reserved a solid 25 minutes for question and answer to field your comments and questions. Um, so Margaret, let's go ahead to the next slide, and we're going to start with a quick poll for you all. Um, so Margaret, if you want to pull up the first poll and go ahead and push that out. Um, for those of you who are, are on, you should see the poll come up on your screen in just a minute. Um, Margaret, let us know when- They already? Okay, perfect. Um, so the first question is, is what do you think, you know, is, is the most effective solution for, for the food, you know, current food access and access to basic needs situation right now for particularly for people in the informal settlements. Um, so if you guys can just sort of respond and submit your answers, we'll leave it up for another maybe 15 seconds or so. So please give us, give us your responses there. 
Um, maybe we'll give it another five seconds and then Margaret, you can close the poll and, and show us what people are thinking. So this is, we're curious to hear what you all think is gonna be the most effective solution. And then maybe I think we'll, we'll probably get into hearing some healthy debate uh, and conversations from the participants. Uh, Margaret, okay, so, can you publish the poll? Yeah. So <laughs> most people think that providing them with vouchers that can be redeemed for their basic needs is like the most important thing to do and followed with giving them cash and uh, finally providing them with care packages. Super, super. All right, so on that note, I think Samir will go right into your presentation. Margaret, if you wanna go ahead to the next slide uh, for Shikalia. Um, and Samir will hand it over to you. Um, I know Margaret's going to pull up the slide in a second. Thank you. Uh, while Margaret pulls up the slide, um, I'll just begin. Thanks so much for having me and thanks for organizing this. I think it's really important for a coordination of these efforts um, as we are certainly in, a, in an emergency right now. For a bit of background, um, I'm here representing Shikilia, which is different than my day job. Um, I run Africa's first solar irrigation company. So I think a lot about food and food production and how to make sure the most economically vulnerable have access to their basic needs. Um, and as we all know, measures to stop the spread of COVID-19 in Kenya have destroyed informal labor markets and daily incomes that households rely on. Um, Shikilia is a collaboration between private sector and nonprofit organizations trying to answer the question how do we help the most economically vulnerable Kenyan communities replace lost income due to COVID-19 and increase health, wealth, and happiness? And to us, there are two critical steps in the immediate time frame to ensure that the most vulnerable can meet their basic needs. The first is maintaining strong supply chains for food and other While I fully believe in the need for food production, um, I do believe that we need to think about food production in the, in the medium term. But today, immediately, we really need to focus on maintaining strong, strong supply chains for food and essential goods and ensuring people have cash on hand to, pro, to provide these essential goods. So Shikilia sends, and you can be on slide three, Shikalia sends monthly cash transfers to low-income households during the pandemic. We're targeting the most vulnerable people and we'll be sending them 3,000 shillings a month for three months, which is about 30 US dollars per month for, 30, for three months. Transfer programs around the world and in Kenya, demonstrate that they lead to immediate and long-term relief from poverty. They enable households to pay for essential items, such as economic multiplier effect, where every dollar boosts local GDP by $2.60. Extensive evidence shows that they are not abused by recipients. And particularly important for this conversation, in countries like Kenya, where the food system works relatively well, cash transfers can be better for food security than food handouts or vouchers. Matthew from the World Food Program can probably speak to this more as they've done a lot of the leading research on this. Now, successful cash transfer programs already exist in Kenya. Some of you may know about the Inua Jami program. You can think of Shikalia as adapting these existing programs to respond to COVID-19. You can go to the next slide. If you simplify cash transfer programs, we need to do four things and we need to do them really well. We need to target the right individuals. We need to transfer funds in an efficient, transparent, and accountable way. We need to fundraise and we need to conduct M&E. 
current government programs do all four of these, but they do them in a way that does not necessarily um, contribute to the current pandemic crisis. So Shikali is adapting these four parts of cash transfer programs to leverage technology to scale. So on the targeting side, existing government safety net programs target vulnerable individuals, but mostly the elderly, orphans, and those that are at risk of drought. So a lot of people in the North. We're working with Dahlberg Research to use geospatial and demographic data to target the most vulnerable during this pandemic. When it comes to transfers, you can stay on the same slide, yeah. When it comes to transfers, existing government programs, mostly sent through banks, um, we're using the near universal mobile money infrastructure in Kenya to send funds instead of using banks, which removes person-to-person -person contact. To fundraise, we're leveraging the power of a coalition to coordinate fundraising. Coordination means speed, and speed is so important right now. And when it comes to evaluation, we're expanding and many operations to include phone calls and SMS services to ensure scale. You can go to the next slide. So the, the call to action to everyone here is, is funding. The more we raise, the more households we can reach. And the longer we wait, the more people go hungry. I know everyone has seen recent articles in the New York Times and BBC, but people are going hungry right now and cash transfers can help soften the blow. To achieve our goals, Shikilia is raising 200 million US dollars in total. We're raising 25 million US dollars immediately to deliver 3,000 shillings per month for three months to 250,000 at-risk Kenyans and an additional $175 million to reach 1.75 million more at-risk Kenyans over the next three months. Our website will go live tomorrow. It will be www shikilia.com you can fund directly through there or you can fund directly through give directly who is best in class for cash transfers they're one of our coalition partners or for those of you on the call who are going to be putting forth larger check sizes and require grant agreements you can email us directly at give g-i-v-e at shikilia.com for more information and just to close i i hope that you'll all consider supporting this initiative and inviting others to do so as well. Your support can make a huge difference in the lives of Kenyan families. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Samir. And maybe you want to also put that email address in the chat to everyone, just in case they want to reach out to you. Sure. Um, and again, if anyone has any questions for Samir and the work they're doing, feel free to put them in the chat box. Thanks so much, uh, James. We'll come back to your question um, in a few minutes. Uh, Margaret, go ahead to, to the next slide. Um, and next up we have, um, who is next? I think James is, James will be next, our next presenter. At Life Song Kenya. Hi everyone. My name is James Ouma, the founder of Life Song Kenya. So Life Song Kenya mentors and empowers boys and at risk male teens who are in juvenile prison. So what we usually do is uh, we train them in skills, we teach them character formation, as well as reconcile them with family members, the police officers, and the people that they have wronged. And uh, the second program that we have is, is, uh, is in Kangemi, where, which is an informal school. So, so, so due to COVID, we decided to feed just 10 families. However, however, when we're profiling these families to see which, which specific families need help, we discovered that we had gotten their teachers. Mm -hmm. So after adding the teachers on the list, our list shot to 20 families. So we went on Facebook and we, <clears throat> we began fundraising and we were able to raise 50,000 shillings on Facebook. Uh, so far we've, uh, we've, okay, so far we provided our care packages to over 10 families. Uh, so what we do is, so what we do is we sit down with each family and then we find out what do they usually use during their normal uh, life. And so, and so then now 
we tell them that we have a budget of 1,000 shillings. And so with this budget, uh, after they've drawn a list, then now we link them with the shops that are in the local communities so that now they buy, for, they buy from those shops. So what happened is uh, we pay directly to them. And so what they do is that they go each and every day uh, to pick foodstuffs, kerosene, uh, some of them vegetables, sugar, and other things. Yeah, so uh, the next slide. So the lessons that we are learning, no, the second one, the, the lessons that I'm learning is that 1,000 shillings is not enough. Because originally we had thought that 1,000 shillings would be enough for one week. But we've come to discover that some of these families are large. Actually, the smallest family that we are taking care of has two members. The largest has six members. And you find that they have other needs that are more than food. Uh, we found out that the sick grandmother who needs uh, like painkiller every evening. And so we started now like factoring that in our, in our plan. Also, we find that there's a mother who needs like diapers. So, and also milk for their child. So what we do is we meet that specific need that they've mentioned. And so we, we, are, we are coming to discover that 1,000 shillings is not enough. Uh, slide three. Yeah, so for us at Life on Kenya, we usually use, we usually use what, we, okay, what we have because we still do not have funding as an organization. So we began with what we have. And so that's why our, our immediate need uh, are bicycles, are bicycles. Right now, okay, right now we have three volunteers who have gone to the field. So some of them do not have bicycles. And so they're using public means of transport. The reason why we're using bicycles is because we usually cycle uh, to and from our programs. And so for, that, for us, that cuts, cuts our cost. Uh, the other need that we have right now is volunteers and especially volunteers who are willing to cycle. <laughs> yeah, volunteers who are willing to cycle. And so, and so volunteers also who can also help us like uh, collect data, uh, collect data, help us to like uh, just come, with, come up with the tools that can enable us to monitor and evaluate our program, especially the one that we are doing right now with the care packages that we're giving to families. The other thing that we need is partnership, both during COVID and way beyond COVID, because we've, we've come to discover that uh, <clears throat> the children, as in most families, after their children have gone to school, some of them usually do not eat lunch. And that's why right now, when you ask them, how much do you spend on food in a day? They do not have an idea because usually their children go to school and their children feed in school. So this has taught us that, uh, that parents really need help with feeding their children in school. And because the school where we are at, uh, they feed on rice and beans, like from Monday to Friday, we would like to, okay, we would like to use this same, 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 same program and approach to start providing meals when schools resume. So that's why uh, we need partnerships. And so, and so, and so right now, our call to action is that, uh, is that the money that we are raising on Facebook is not enough. And so uh, we are looking for support so that we'll be able to, to feed the 25 families that we have in our program right now. It costs 6,000 to feed one family for the whole month. So that translates to 150,000 to feed the 25 families that we have. Yeah, so I think for me, for me, I think that's all. Sorry, I was trying to unmute and the slides went crazy. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, James. Really appreciate your, your insights and also sharing your learnings. I think that's really important uh, for all of us on the call to understand 
um, that you're trying some things before we, we get these things right. Um, so again, thanks to everyone who's been submitting the questions. Again, if anyone has some specific questions for James, uh, we'll come back to those towards the end. Um, right now, we'll take a quick break to, to take an audience poll from, from all of you, Margaret, if we can push the poll out. Um, this time with the poll, what we wanted to understand from your perspectives, for those of you on the call, to understand who do you think is best placed to actually deliver um, you know, some of these services through vouchers or cash transfers? Um, is it large organizations? Is it small community-based organizations like James? Um, is it uh, you know, private corporations and companies? Is it government? Um, so Margaret, do we have the poll up? Yes, it's up. People are answering it. Perfect. Perfect. So maybe uh, for everyone on the call, we'll give that another 10 or 15 more seconds. Um, so please put in your, your answer. We have uh, another few seconds. We'll just leave that open. So really, again, just want to understand from your perspective, who is best placed um, in your perspective to, to, to support the, the you know, families in need, um, particularly in informal settlements with basic food and services. Um, so Margaret, why don't we go ahead and stop the poll uh, and publish it? And let's see, um, let's see what everyone said. <clears throat> Okay, so 58% of the people thought that joint efforts from, organi from organizations above, this means both all the grassroots community level organizations, the government, international aid, family, and the local corporation should all come together and um, assist. The other favorite one was grassroots community level organizations. These are the ones that are probably already working inside the informal um, settlements. Um, and then local corporations and government was the last one. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much, Margaret, for running us through that. And thank you everyone for giving us your perspectives. Um, our next speaker that we're going to move to is David. Um, so David, uh, let's, let's cue you up. Um, David, are you there? Let me, I'm going to unmute you, David. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm with you right now. Good morning, all. Uh, I'm glad to share this uh, thought around the uh, assessing food and other resources for vulnerable communities, in particular people with disabilities. Uh, Center for Citizens with Disabilities is an organization of uh, for persons with disabilities that works to educate, support, and empower persons with disabilities and their families to maximize their potentials. We also work to promote uh, uh, disability rights, uh, independent living, as well as inclusion of people with disabilities in development agenda. We've been doing this for the past uh, uh, 15 years. Uh, we've succeeded in engaging government to secure a law that will protect people with disabilities and their families to maximize their potentials, in particular, criminalizing discrimination on the grounds of disability. Uh, uh, federal has a law, uh, states has laws. In Lagos, about 10 states, including Lagos State, uh, they also have laws on people with disabilities. Uh, next slide. Um, David. Yeah, next slide, yeah. Yeah, 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 David, I think we only had one, one slide from, from your side. Sorry for that. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, um, the uh, situation we have our, uh, at hand here in COVID, in which uh, COVID-19, in which uh, uh, Lagos State, Ondo State, Abuja FCT, and other states are on lockdown. What that means is that more than 25 million Nigerians with disabilities will be uh, disproportionately affected uh, in terms of access to food and resources. Uh, uh, looking at uh, the situation or the background of people with in Nigeria, uh, efforts in the past to reach out to them has been very difficult. They are always being uh, clustered around vulnerable group. And the question is, who are these vulnerable groups? Who are the vulnerable population in Nigeria? It's always a, a kind of ambiguity in defining who is a vulnerable group. And most times when resources are being provided, people with disabilities are excluded, they are marginalized, 
and most times they are left behind. Uh, this COVID-19 uh, pandemic has exposed uh, the situation wider in terms of absence of data. What we are doing is that we are working in collaboration with cluster groups as well as uh, organizations to reach out to people with disabilities with food items Uh, 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 transfer uh, and food items. Um, uh, we we uh, understand that government, uh, in their effort to reach out to people or communities with uh, relief materials, effort were not made to target people with disabilities. In particular, uh, we struggle to get government attention. We struggle to get uh, the uh, 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 organizations that are sharing uh, deliverables to marginalized population, uh, we, we, we couldn't. So what we did was to uh, reach out to cluster groups, reach out to uh, networks, uh, and go house to house to deliver food items. Beyond that also, we are also sharing uh, the uh, cash transfer to these uh, uh, people with disabilities in, in various locations. Those who have their account numbers, we transfer cash to them, ranging from 5,000, and 10,000 Naira, uh, depending on the amount we're able to, to mobilize within the specific area. Opportunities we have now is around continue to do advocacy, you know, to lobby the government to, to understand the situation of possibilities and to ensure that uh, our networks that are working on, you know, providing food or support or providing resources to vulnerable population, consider people with disabilities first, which is in line with uh, the National Disability Act, as well as Lagos State Prayer Post Law. We provide that in situation of emergency, people with disabilities should be given priority. Uh, where they are accused, they also should be given priority. So these are things we are looking at. What we'll be begging or what we'll be asking is for support. Support in terms of, you know, uh, cash, to reach out to more population. Um, we're also seeking for collaborations and partnership. Part of the areas we success so much is the area of partnership, in particular, uh, organizations that are also supporting vulnerable populations. We, we partner with them, reach out to them with contacts of people with disabilities within the locality where they are uh, working, so as to ensure that people with disabilities are not left uh, behind. Uh, we will continue to engage uh, with uh, uh, the frontline nurses and doctors who are working on COVID-19 for them to understand disability issues and ensure that they take appropriate measure to cover issues that has to do with uh, COVID-19 uh, positive patients uh, with disabilities. So these are the areas we have worked on and we, we look forward to partner as with many organizations as possible in order for us to, you know, to reach out to more people with disabilities. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, James, for that. Um, I'm sorry, David. Thank you so much, David, for that. Really, Again, really appreciate it. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat that were coming through. Um, so again, we'll field those. We have one more presenter, and then we'll get to the questions. Again, anyone with additional questions for, for David, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, I will now ask um, Matthew uh, from the World Food Program uh, to, uh, to go ahead and start. And Matthew, I've got your, your slides up. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm from the, the UN World Food Program from the regional office for uh, Eastern Southern, uh, Eastern, the Horn of Africa. Um, we have another office in, in Southern Africa, in Johannesburg covering Southern Africa and another one in Dakar covering West Africa. Um, so this, the COVID for us represents a, a huge crisis. Uh, the, uh, yesterday our, our executive director even addressed the UN Security Council about the scale of the, of, of the challenge that faces all of us and all the governments and all the societies, uh, that we could be moving from a public health uh, risk, from a, from a health pandemic, to what, what he termed a, a hunger pandemic. Um, so the challenge is enormous, and, and we're seeing the epicenter of this in these urban centers, 
uh, that we are all uh, working in. We're looking at these urban centers with large informal settlements as being like a ground zero, uh, not just to spread, the, not just to contain the, the public health crisis, but also uh, seeking to address the, the immediate socioeconomic impact. Number one for us is undertaking regional um, uh, vulnerability and market analysis so that we understand what's happening in the food markets, what's happening in the supply chains. Um, and what's happening in, in, in the prices so that people, um, so we monitor how can people access their food from the markets. Number one, as, as Samir mentioned at the moment, at, at, at the beginning, number one priority is to ensure that these regional markets are functioning. We do not want a protectionist uh, response from governments where uh, borders are start being closed uh, for commodities. We need commodities and, and trade to continue flowing. Um, so that's number one. Um, number two, we're, we're looking at what's the impact of the crisis, not just in terms of um, markets, but also in terms of people's ability to access uh, food from those markets. So it's really vulnerability analysis, looking at the, the impact of the crisis on the economy, on employment. Um, and we're seeing already that in these urban centers, this is where unemployment is, is reaching very low levels people are losing their sources of, of, uh, of income and that's that's leading to the vulnerability that we're all here trying to address um, we also have to not lose sight of the fact that there's very significant um, pre-existing emergency food assistance needs throughout uh, Africa um, in this region alone of East uh, and uh, Horn of Africa, we, we're assisting um, over 6 million internally displaced people and 3 million refugees. So we've got to continue the humanitarian supply chains um, to assist these populations and to continue uh, resourcing for these people. At the same time, we've got to scale up and mobilize resources to affect these new populations who are affected by the, by the socioeconomic impact of, of COVID. And these populations are largely, not entirely, but are, are largely found in these urban areas where actually traditionally us in the UN uh, and World Food Programme, we're not operating. This is not our normal area of, of intervention. Next slide, please. Challenges, of, co of course, number, the governments are in, are in the lead in, in um, framing and, and financing the response. But there's, very, there's different parts of government at play here. Um, we've got the emergency and disaster management arms of government, uh, these ministries. Often they favour more of a traditional type of emergency response of what we call in-kind food. Uh, so providing maize and beans and oil. That's the way their budgets are structured. Um, and, and they're mobilising as we speak the resources uh, to do that throughout many countries in, in the continent. Then you've got the other arms of government, which are managing the social protection uh, response, which is the safety nets, the cash transfers. Often it's not the, the emergency arms of government that are favoring a cash approach. It's the, it's the social protection arms, the ministries of community development, um, the ones that manage these targeted um, cash transfer programs uh, to particular population groups. Then you've also got, in some countries, you've got um, finance allocated for emergency response into local government budgets. So that's the other arm of government that you have to coordinate with here. Um, all of that then, we have to understand that in order to frame and coordinate our own response, not just as the UN, but with um, all of us as, 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 um, as uh, non-profits and, and as, uh, as uh, philanthropists. Uh, because we have to frame our response and coordinate it with that, with that uh, government-led effort. Um, we've also got to um, mobilise the money uh, for this. So the governments themselves, are, they're, they're, they're reprioritising their own public finance expenditure. So they're, they're drawing money from some non-essential expenditure or investment and expenditure and moving it towards these immediate needs. But that's not enough. So we're already seeing just in this region of Eastern Horn of Africa, uh, we're going to be needing to mobilize in excess of $500 million to meet these emergency food needs as a result of this um, uh, COVID crisis. Next slide, please. So the, the, 
the key asks, uh, leading on from that, that financial ask of, of many hundreds of millions of dollars, we're also asking the international financial institutions like the um, World Bank and the IMF to support governments to provide uh, tax relief for these urban populations, as well as other forms of like rent relief uh, and perhaps even some forms of subsidy, but all that, that has to be managed very carefully. Um, we then, our collective responsibility as partners of government is coordination. So all of us as UN, NGOs, CBOs, faith-based groups and philanthropists, we all have to invest in this uh, ability to coordinate. Because if we don't coordinate, there's going to be huge inefficiencies, which is going to undermine the effectiveness of the response. Um, there's, all, there's many different coordination mechanisms. Here in Kenya, we've got some, we're calling it humanitarian hubs being created, uh, where uh, partners are expected to register and then uh, uh, share what, what their plans are and what, and what their targeting is. I think the key is going to be in the targeting. How do we all harmonise and coordinate our targeting of the assistance um, so that we're not doing multiple uh, layers of interventions uh, to the same households in the same uh, informal uh, settlements. Then we also need to coordinate the type of assistance we're providing. So food in itself is insufficient. Uh, we've got to be uh, coordinating what we call non-food assistance uh, with the food assistance. Otherwise, you, you end up just people having to essentially sell or, 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 or share too much so much of their food assistance in order to cover the non-food needs. So that's some of what James was talking about and, and, and David as well. So we can't just look at the, uh, the, the food needs in isolation. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Matthew. And thank you so much to, to all of our participants. I think um, we've had a lot of really fantastic different perspectives on this topic. Um, so just to, to sort of lead into to q and I mean, the first poll that we had asked everyone when they were joining was which intervention would work best. Um, and about 47% of you said that vouchers um, is more if, is the most effective, followed by about 36% said cash or mobile money. Um, so just want to hear, uh, you know, from the speakers, I mean, what is, what is some of your perspectives on vouchers versus cash? Um, I know Michael Hopkins sent in a chat on the, the link um, to, to one of the newspapers here um, that gave some perspectives, but if vouchers are better, why are vouchers better? If your opinion is cash is better, why, why is cash better? Um, just would like to sort of deep into that, deep dive into that debate a little bit more. Um, Samir, do you wanna do you wanna start on that? Yeah, I'd I'd be happy to. Um, I think the the important thing here is that there is you know the the benefit of being in twenty twenty is that there have been years of randomized controlled trials, years of studies on this exact topic, and there there are really three three points to make here. The first is what uh, Dr. Michael Hopkins wrote. Um, while it's important to think about food, we also have to think about rent, healthcare, transportation. Um, there is a bigger need here than just food. Um, and a number of the folks that we're looking to support in the immediately affected urban areas, and I saw a question about rural areas, and I think that's a good one, but the immediately affected urban areas is we have to think about what is the, what are this suite of basic needs that we need to account for? So that's the first. Food vouchers often result in food costing more and less aid being received as recipients have fewer traders to pick up from resulting in less market competition. I'll put two studies in the chat. I'm not gonna share my opinion here. I'm just gonna let the report speak for themselves. Uh, one was done by BCG and one was done by the World Food Program and it has a bit more information. So I'll share those two links in the chat immediately after this. And then the third thing to, to to realize is that in, in past situations where choice is limited and cash or flexibility is needed, aid recipients often sell food for cash at a loss, which distorts local markets. Um, 
there was a study done among Syrian refugees um, and 70% reported having sold food aid. I'll also share that. So the, I think what's, what's important here is that I, it's, it's a really interesting debate, but this isn't time for an intellectual debate. The evidence base shows that cash transfers are needed now. And if we continue this, this debate for, for much longer, we really risk losing time and, and losing people. Um, and I, I, I'm just hopeful that the evidence base is strong enough that um, people at all levels of the private sector and the government really, really see that, uh, that this is the way forward for this. I'm not saying food vouchers are not useful in other contexts, but as an emergency response today, the evidence shows that cash transfers is the, is the best bet for economic security, food security, and wellness. Great, thank you so much, Samir. Um, and just following on that, there, there were several questions that came up specifically about data. Um, and I think this also speaks, uh, Samir, to sort of your evidence-based point. Um, and uh, James, I'll, I'll go to you on one of these. So someone I think specifically was asking about if you have any data on the vulnerable families that you're supporting. Um, and following that, David, there was another similar question around the, 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 the actual numbers of people with disabilities um, in Nigeria. So um, James, do you wanna start and, and tell us, um, do you have any data on, on sort of the, the vulnerable people that you're serving? Um, you know, and, and, and how do you identify those families? Was that question for me? Uh, no, that question was for James. James, are, okay. I see you're still with us. Um, uh, just make sure you're on, not on mute. Okay, I think, I think James might be having some uh, audio issues. Um, so maybe David, we'll go over to you in the interim while I think James is switching his headphones out. Um, can you t tell us a little bit more about David on the, the, the sort of numbers and data that you have on people with disabilities in Nigeria? And James, we'll come back to you in just a minute. And... David, I am unmuting you. Yeah, go so ahead. So much. So thank you so much. Yeah, well, it's estimated that more than 25 million Nigerians are living with one form of disability or the other, with 80% living in rural areas with minimal access to social infrastructure. Here in Lagos State, it is estimated that more than 2 million persons having one form of disability or the other. Uh, that is the data or the situation here in Nigeria in terms of data. Uh, you will probably know that this, this, this uh, data is estimated using uh, World Bank and World Health Organization report of 2011, which says that more than 25, more than 15% of population of the world has one form of disability or the other. Using 200 million Nigerian population, uh, we are saying that uh, if you uh, use it to times uh, the 15 percent of international population, you will be estimating more than 25 million Nigerians. And that is what we are using to estimate the population of people with disabilities in Nigeria. We also know that uh, the key problem is that government at, at its own level is not keeping its own data. Uh, for the past, uh, uh, for the past uh, uh, 15 years of, or, or so 14 years, we are yet to conduct a census. So uh, as I speak to you, government cannot say this is exact number of their own, of, of, of our people using their own data. Rather, we on the international statistics using World Health and uh, a World Bank uh, uh, projection of 15% of international population. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. And can you quickly tell us how many families or individuals you have served in Nigeria? How many people with disabilities that, that you've um, supported since COVID? Okay, uh, I don't have 
the exact figure right now uh, because uh, my colleague is is working on it because every day requests are being made and the the account department and others are working assiduously to get it better. We are we are reaching around one thousand or one thousand two you know individuals in Nigeria. Okay, super. Thank you. Um, and maybe since David sort of picked up on the government piece, there was a question. Um, oh, I'm sorry, David. Let's come back. Uh, sorry, James. We'll come back to you. Can you? Um, let's see if your audio is working. Yes, can you hear me now? Brilliant. Yes. So yeah, please tell us um, what sort of data you're able to collect on the communities that you're working with, uh, or where that data is coming from, and how you identify the vulnerable families that you are serving. Okay. So uh, for me, for me, uh, after I lost my job in twenty in twenty thirteen, like to focus on developing a program for boys who are, okay, who are in juvenile prison. I was a beneficiary of charity, but now w what used to happen is that nobody thought to ask me what exactly I need. They just gave me what they thought I wanted, and so and so for us data. So 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 how did we identify the beneficiaries? One of our programs is at a school at a school in Kangemi, and so and so most of these parents are not yeah. able to even pay for feeding programs that are in school. And also most of the time when the children come to school, they are hungry. And so when we thought of, uh, okay, like of helping because of the funding that we had, we decided to pick just 10 families. Yeah, but now, but now after adding uh, like their teachers and, and <clears throat> other people who are asking for help also on Facebook and on WhatsApp, we are now at 25. So far, so far we've served 20 families. So we are collecting their data and we are working on it. The only challenge that we are having is because we are a small organization that doesn't have funding, you find that our data is still very manual because what happens is that is that I'm collecting them on okay, like on notebooks. So I have like hundreds of notebooks that are, are yet to be captured. Yeah, so like I mentioned before, so what we, our approach usually is we just deal with small numbers so that now we see when we come to a point now where we like we have resources, then now how can we scale up our program? So, so like right now we're just working with 25 families. Okay, excellent. So, so definitely, uh, you know, integration with technology as you scale it sounds to be super important. Um, and I'm going to come back to the government question uh, because this has been uh, popped up a couple of times. So, um, and I'll leave this. I mean, I don't know, Mike, Matthew, if you want to take this up, or, or anyone, whoever the speakers are, let me know who wants to respond to this. But you know, the question is: Has anyone had any experience in government coordination in these efforts? And if so, how has that gone? Uh, the second sort of half of this question you know, connects with the second poll that we did around coordination efforts. So everyone obviously said that a coordinated effort between different types of organizations would be the most effective. Um, you know, can, you know, could any of you speak to your partnerships or level of coordination, whether it's with government or private sector or philanthropy or civil society organizations? Um, so just want to understand that, that a bit better. How, how do we actually coordinate our efforts better to reach these people in need, um, Matthew, do you want to do you want to take that um, or and and Samir, I see your hand up. Then we'll go to you. Sure, um, it's the, the, there's it, there's a, a lot of actors here, um, and even in in many cases, governments have not actually yet begun in their own um, in their own emergency responses. In some countries, they haven't actually yet started uh, doing emergency cash transfers, whether it's through social protection or through um, emergency in-kind food distributions. Um, I think the, the the primary coordination mechanism is going to be through local government. It's going to be through, um, uh, I think the central government is not going to be able to coordinate all of these actors. There's so many involved in so many different cities within countries, not just the capital cities. So I think we're going to have to be looking at local government in conjunction with the Red Cross societies. I think the, the Red Cross society is going to play a very important role uh, in coordinating the, the humanitarian uh, response to this. Um, we're all just, as I said, we're all going to have to invest in our, in our ability to engage with those mechanisms. 
Um, we've also on the UN side, we've got um, OCHA, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, uh, but they're, they're primarily supporting um, local uh, partners like the Red Cross to, to step up into the lead coordination mechanism. So it's going to be a combination of coordinating with government uh, at the local level and with, uh, with key um, partners like, like the, the Red Cross. Um, I'll just add a little bit. <clears throat> yeah, um, just from the Shikalia standpoint, because I think there were some direct questions. Shikalia is a collaboration between its sector and um, we, every solution should see themselves as how do we support each other? Um, I think Matthew was talking about before, but I mean, coordination is so important here. And what, what will be really important for governments is to how do you how do you essentially decentralize solutions and then centralize the coordination of the solutions? Um, the Kenyan government has started to create um, a number of private sector committees, which I hope will help coordinate a lot of these efforts. Um, but I, I think any any solution that we're talking about here needs to be a partnership between public, private, and government. Um, otherwise, you'll have fraud, you'll have double counting, um, and you'll have just slower speed. And like I said, speed is really important. Fantastic. And we're running out of time, but I'm going to ask, and, and there are so many good questions. Um, so I would encourage everyone to, to sort of continue this conversation. I know ABPA has started uh, Slack channels on this, um, so I don't want this to be the end of the conversation, but there was a really interesting question um, about the distribution channels you guys are using. I know James mentioned the use of bicycles and volunteers. Um, you know, Samir and, and Matthew and even David, if you want to talk about like what, what actually are the channels that you're using? Using to get this support um, to those in need and and if you can just give maybe a quick like 30 second <laughs> response just because we're running out of time but I think that would be really insightful uh, I can go first um, for, from from the world food program we, uh, primarily we're, we're using um, uh, NGOs non-governmental organizations uh, and the National Red Cross Societies and faith-based groups uh, would be our primary cooperating partners to deliver this assistance. Um, in some cases, we'll also be using uh, government mechanisms as well. Um, and then we're also looking, at, we're also working very extensively in the in the cash response with financial service providers. They're, they're the ones delivering uh, the the cash directly to the beneficiaries. So we're working very extensively with the financial sector as well. Right. Fantastic. Um, David, any comment here from, from the Nigerian perspective on the, the distribution channels you're using? Um, David, you're on mute. Let me just... Um, Uh, David, can you unmute yourself? Oh, here we go. I can unmute you for you. Okay, go ahead, David. Okay, thank, you. thank you so much. I, I was saying that we, uh, we belong to a network of NGOs, a network of disabled people's organizations in Nigeria. Uh, we're also working in about 15 states in the country. So we have a uh, contact and uh, to reach out to disabilities in the government. We have a network of that have branches at the state as well as the local government level. So to reach out people with abilities that are vulnerable, using the data we've collected in the past during the elections in which we collected data in about uh, eight states in the country, we are able to reach as many as we could, you know, depending on the nature of the individuals. We receive calls from time to time informing us about someone who is in their need of help. So what we do is that we look at the best up to the individual. If it is cash, we send the cash, and we ask the person that will receive it on his behalf to confirm that he has gotten. We also use our networks, our partners, uh, that are working in, in area of uh, relief supply and palliatives. So contact them, we network them with individual abilities in their needs. By so doing, we reach as many people as we could. In terms of government, uh, uh, the best approach to do a cash transfer, 
An average Nigerian at banks has a, what we call a BVN. And if you're a person that has BVN, if you're a person that has a bank, a bank account, it's easier for people to channel money through you. You can use your mobile phone, you can use a, a internet a transfer, and such individual will get such a support uh, as when necessary. So these are the approaches we are using so far. Okay, thank you so much, David. And I know we're running out of time, but there was one really good question that I wanted to field. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry uh, if we're gonna maybe run a, two more minutes over. Um, but there was a question, and maybe Matthew, this this you would want to field this one. The question was really about um, you know a triple threat, uh, particularly outside of Nairobi. In the Kenyan context, we have locusts, we have flooding, now we have COVID. Um, it seems that the world is coming to an end. Uh, <laughs> uh, if we were looking at the Bible, um, so just curious, you know, if you might be able to provide some context as to what's happening outside of Nairobi, um, because obviously, you know, informal settlements and and the sort of base of the pyramid are not just in slums, but a lot of people are sort of suffering outside of the city um, and just wanted to get your sense on if there's any sort of immediate quick response that's, that's addressing all of these issues, you know, or, or at least looking at them in a holistic manner and not just the locust plague or the flooding problem or the COVID problem. Um, do you want to give a few, a few minutes to, to address that question? Yeah, I mean, it, this is a, it, it's like a perfect storm, which is, which is gathering. Um, and uh, very deliberately, uh, our executive director the other day, when addressing the UN Security Council, talked about uh, you know, biblical proportions of, of hunger, which could develop as a result of this convergence of risk of, of floods, locusts, uh, and the socioeconomic impact of, um, of the COVID pandemic. Um, in this region of Eastern Horn of Africa alone, we're, we're looking at a potential doubling of the numbers of food insecure populations from around 20 million where we are now, uh, uh, pushing right up to around 40 million. Um, so all of these needs, the net result is these populations require assistance uh, and employment. Um, so uh, yes, we're gonna have, a, have an increase in, in the humanitarian ask and the humanitarian needs, but there's gonna be, an, uh, we're gonna need a whole of society approach here. There's gonna need to be a multi-functional, uh, multi-sector response to address this escalating level of, of hunger that we're going to be seeing. If we don't address it, not just in the urban areas, but in these rural areas, then um, we, we could see very significant instability and, and unrest and um, increased mortality and, and widespread malnutrition, which could lead to um, extreme hunger, uh, if not famine in certain circumstances. Thank you so much, Matthew. And I, I realize we are over time. Um, Frank, I'm going to hand it back to you for some closing remarks. Uh, Margaret, if you want to move to the next slide. Um, I, once again, thank you so much for our participants. The, the chat was again uh, overwhelming. Um, and I'll ask Frank to also just touch on how people can continue this conversation um, after, this, after this webinar is over. So Frank, uh, over to you. Ariel, uh, thank you so much. And, and to everyone else who's been part of this uh, process, please, uh, I'd like to pass my gratitude. This is, uh, COVID crisis has put us in a really tentative situation where a lot of us are, are now unconsciously incompetent. We're learning and rolling with the punches as we go along. So this conversation should ideally continue. Would love to keep this alive on Twitter, uh, on, uh, on, on, uh, by email. So you'll see our, our details there. We have working groups in Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa, so please feel free to join us in some of that kind of stuff. And, and the other thing we are, you will also be sending out to you as part of a follow-up to this conversation is um, we're starting to see if we can aggregate post-COVID uh, investment opportunities. So as you know, we're about looking at how we can fl um, increase the uh, flow of capital into the right investment opportunities for social impact. We want to create an open source uh, Google Doc where we want to invite people to put in ideas of things that we need to address uh, post-COVID that will be giving us more sustainable and systemic solutions. Uh, so anything from the stuff we've had today around building databases and building better coordination, all of that is stuff that uh, um, some form of uh, social investors, impact investors and other kind of people can plug into later. So we're gonna try and ask your help for your help. Uh, to contribute to that, uh, uh, trying to envision what the post-COVID world will look like and what things we need to be looking 
and putting money behind now to support that ideal world. Otherwise, thank you so much, Ariel. I appreciate um, everyone's time and over back to you. Great, thanks once again. Uh, Margaret, if you want to move to the next slide. We'll wrap it up here. Thank you again. We will host <coughs> the next discussion next week on the 30th at the same time. I think we're looking at the impact of education next week, um, but we'll be circulating the specific detail and the speakers um, either later this week or early next week. So thank you all so much for joining once again, and we will be circulating the slides, the presentation, and some of these links um, to some of these articles that, that Samir and, and Dr. Michael Hopkins have shared. Um, and we'll also be sharing some more information about how to get involved in the Slack channels of the WhatsApp groups to keep the conversation going. So once again, thank you all so much for your time. And thank you once again to our speakers. Um, I'll give you a big round of applause. Um, uh, thank you all, you were wonderful. Um, and we look forward to seeing everyone once again next week. Um, and we do hope this was helpful uh, for those of you who are developing programs um, or designing them um, and, and if you, all the speakers are okay with it, we'll be happy to share your contact details with those people who were on the webinar. I know there was a lot of specific questions and follow-ups that people would like to do. Um, so thanks once again and hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day and thank you for joining us.